I got that. Okay, All right, so guys. Well, welcome. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> oh, no, I do have to do it that way. I thought we weren't going to have to do the slap. The clap. Uh, you don't have to clap. That was my initiation right. for you. Go ahead. All right, guys. Welcome to Your Fifth Friends podcast, where we are firm believers that you are a product of the five people that you spend the most time with, and we're here to be your fifth friend. What's going on? How are you guys doing today? How's your day been? It's been a busy day, to say the least. I think we have had a lot of things over the last few months that we've been spending a lot of time on with each of our businesses right now. And I think one thing that we wanted to do is create a atmosphere for us to have more conversations with one another, really talk about things that you know we really are passionate about, and to get some really good information in front of a lot of people. What do you guys think about that? I mean, Simon's got his suit on. He's ready to rock and roll McDonald's over here. He's got Check his chest out. hairs playing right now. Shaved, ready to go for the first Shaved day. Shaved has feeling like John Travolta making his dad proud. <laughs> this is the expectation that people are going to assume and they're going to be let down every other time with the wife feeders. But they'll, they'll come and see that when it comes in. I have some cool things to talk about. Our world has been revolving around AI right now. And I feel like in the beginning, it was more like there's a crypto phase and everybody's into their NFTs and da da da. Mm -hmm. Now we're in that AI phase and everybody's talking about this and the other. But people aren't really thinking about the fucking application of what they could be doing with the AI. I want us to talk about some of the things that we use every single day that actually make our life easier, make the businesses run, and actually has a use case. Yeah. I'm just happy that there's actually like utility to this AI and we're not down like the crypto NFT stuff where it's like cool idea, but like literally zero utility not being utilized in the real world. Like this AI stuff is actually affecting the stuff that we're working on on a day to day basis, which I think is actually interesting. I think we're all trying to find out ways to make our lives easier. Like a big one for me before AI was popping was like Zapier. Mm -hmm. That to me was super cool because it was the con this is like before we knew anything about coding and APIs and documentation. It was like, this is talking here. This is talking here. How do we put it together? Zap was the conduit. To me, that was really cool. And now there's actual applications that we can get into that are going to make life even more better than what that was. Perfect example. We have a podcast studio right now that we built. There's four different cameras. There's three different audios. Imagine editing that for hour long clips. Probably Disaster. A couple hours at Dude, least. It would take forever. Now imagine you have the podcast, you have the upload, you have the uploading, and at the end of that, then you wanna make clips and videos and short form and all that jazz. If we started this endeavor, I would say literally three months ago, it would probably cost us what? 5,000 a month, 6,000 a month. You need to hire a dedicated person just to do that part of the process for sure. Just in labor. Yep. But now we use Autopod that sets everything together for us. We use Opus Clip that makes everything short form. By the time we're done filming, it takes 10 minutes to upload, two minutes to edit, and we're off to the hills. Yeah. I think that's just going to really incentivize us to get more content out there to more people because now we don't have to spend all that extra time to, you know, create what we want to create and actually get it to, you know, our audience. We want to be able to take what's on our minds, interview some amazing people and get this information to people as quickly as we can. Yeah. What do you think it does for creators in general? Like there's so many people that have a camera and a dream but they don't have the resources or maybe they don't have the time or the know-how to edit things over and over and over again. Mm. What does it do to the full landscape? Cause like we know about this because like we're Twitter goons and we're looking around at knew this and knew that, like this isn't something everybody knows about yet. Yeah. When they do, what happens? Like, what do you think goes on? I think that this is just an efficiency play. Like it's not really doing anything that it's that like we've been unable to do. You know, this is like a revolution, a revolution of efficiency where like, the podcast could be edited, video could be edited, it could be uploaded, it could be cut up. Like humans were doing that and now makes it so, you know, 15 minutes can now be done in seven hours, which I think is a massive win. Um, and we can go over a million use cases of how the efficiency can be risen. But I think the biggest like thing to like point at and the biggest problem I have with AI that enters the space is like people are expecting this to produce something better than the end result. And it might be able to, but it also can how like you can fall in the habit of just creating like absolute mediocrity regurgitated out of the, content out of the ai side of things and that's like the mess that i think that 90 percent of people's use cases fall into like they don't see this as an efficiency play they see this as like creating gold when in reality this isn't creating gold it's making what you're doing a little bit more quick 
but if it's like quick garbage if it's quick trash then it's like you you still have trash at the end of the day the barrier to entry is lower now but do you think that people are going to make better content or do you think this opens up the floodgate for a lot more people to have a lot more shitty work from what i've seen more shit <laughs> i think it's like if you look at like whether it's like video content like this or whether it's like written blogs or like blogging and for seo it's like it's just a bunch of garbage that's Dude, hitting the it's landscape. a fucking disaster do you guys ever scroll up and down linkedin and see the prompts that people are posting day in and day out. Like you can tell immediately oh, yeah. this was not an original thought. Yeah. It's 60 pages long. The person has no idea what they're talking about. So it I guess so high level. I think the it's great too much. yeah, the great equalizer in my opinion is being able to use AI and use the information that comes in, but like generating original thoughts. Right, being able to take that information to time lapse your ability to find an answer or find the top tips to a certain topic, but actually being able to put your unique perspective. And I think what will not go away is people's ability to create unique content and generate unique ideas to support, you know, an audience, to support the growth of their business. It's all about how you use the technology. And I think what more people need to be able to get a better job of is not only from a prompt engineering side, but also just understanding that the technology right now, it should be used to hopefully time lapse your ability to gather that information in a more streamlined manner. And then ultimately with that time, being able to actually take more time to think about the creative execution yeah. through the use of AI. It's a massive efficiency play. And if you treat it like anything that's not an efficiency play, that's where we really run into a lot of issues. So I'll give you our use case. I'll give you a couple of our use cases that we use. And we use it for like some really complex things and some really simple things. Give me one of each. All right, on the really simple side of things, that's a very, very easy one for us to all understand. It's like content creation on things like LinkedIn, on things like Twitter, et cetera. Um, what we do not do is just generate content based off of it. What we do do it gives you is ideas. we come up with questions and it's an idea generator of like, what kind of question should we ask someone to create content? Okay. So we come up with 50 questions. From there, how do we go and take these 50 like really, really average questions and convert these 50 average questions into like five really good ones? Like, cause there's a lot of shit that will be developed from it. How do you find the five good ones? From there, cool, you have idea generation. From there, we need to respond to that question to create the actual content that'll be displayed in a written or video format. Cool. On a written format, we use tools like fathom.video, which is a really cool tool to help tr automatically- Proud investor. Proud investor over here. I wasn't cool enough to get um, to invest into it. You didn't get the hat. You're not in the I did get it. It was in the guy's signature, all of the above to go and micro invest. Cool. Didn't jump on that opportunity. It's <laughs> Shout out to a Fathom. Good, it's honestly a really good tool. Highly recommend it to anyone to go and check it out. But we use that and it automatically transcribes our video content, which is great. Now you have a transcription of a long, you know, long transcription, which is also not suitable for like Twitter or LinkedIn or anything like that. But then what we do is convert that content, that transcription, which is generated by AI or by transcription service, and we convert that and shrink it down consolidate into it. a quote unquote LinkedIn post. But with that all being said, what that does, is it converts ide our idea. So it's actually our words into a LinkedIn format. But then you run into the instance that you were just talking about, Simon, where you're like, hey, this is way too long, it's way too lengthy, and it needs to be like, you know, you took my ideas, but it's now not in my voice. And then from there, we are updating it, cleaning it up, tightening it up as much as possible. This is all a work in progress. We've only been doing this for a couple of weeks. But then the process is to manually touch it again and tighten it up to then be scheduled and published out there. So we use it for idea generation, transcription, and then putting it into somewhat good format for us then to manually human do it. If we skip all of the human touches of like creating it, the content out of our own words or you know, t uh, tweaking the LinkedIn spit out that came out from ChatGPT, we're gonna have some shit there, but by having a human touch, I think it makes it good. So like, that's the first way that we're utilizing. The second way is a lot more complex. What's the second way? All right, second way we're Explain using AI. Explain it to me like I'm an a incel. Monkey. All right, cool. A monkey that doesn't understand English, got you. <laughs> um, all right, so second way is, all right, we own, myself and Armin, we own a company called Talent Pop. What is Talent Pop? We're a customer service management agency for e-commerce brands. We work with a little over 600 brands. We help, you know, we bring on thousands of agents for these brands. and we have a massive need for us to bring on the best of the best team members for the brands that we're servicing. So in order for us to do it, we need to interview a shitload of people to bring on the best of the best. Literally only 3% of our applicants actually pass to work with a brand. So there is a massive need for us to bring on and like to tighten that up. So top of funnel, we collect about 1100 applications a week. How do we tighten that up to actually be something suitable? 
So we've actually built out our own machine learning algorithms utilizing various ML models, uh, machine learning models, to- Did you guys build it yourselves or are you guys sourcing it from an API somewhere? So we, uh, uh, here's my understanding, which is a very bad understanding of the way all of this <laughs> stuff works, but GitHub is one thing that I've heard of. And GitHub is, it sounds Dude, like- it's a, goaded. It is a directory of like code almost. And it's, it's a directory best. of like models. And it sounded like when I was on these calls helping out with it, it's like, we want 20% of like the Grammarly grammar model and 10% of this and 50% of this. And it's like, we created a mo like we created our own algorithm out of existing models, built it all together. And then what we did is we trained that model to be able to do as good of a job, if not a better job than our human team to actually vet applications. Cause we were failing about 80% of our applicants before even interview one based off just screening experience, um, grammar, English, sentence structure, all of the above. And we were doing it by hand. And as you can imagine, if you're grading 50 of these a day, it's like, dude, you're sent, like, you're just gonna- You're looking at 37 out of 50, you know, applicants on a daily basis. And those 37 out of 50, like they're a waste of time. Yeah. So rather than having someone actually have to go in and reviewing each of those customer service questions in our use case, we're using machine learning to take that heavy work off of, you know, our team's plate so that they can focus on the applicants that are going to be the best fit for our team. It's yeah. been a huge hack for us. So you take, this is effectively what you're doing. You have a ton of applications. Yes. It's all written. Yes. You go to GitHub, which is essentially like the Reddit world of code. You put a couple things together. You built code on top of it. Now the applications that come in, instead of somebody reading through it themselves and saying yes or no, it goes through the code. The code will dissect whatever the paragraphs and wording yeah. is, and it will give it a yes stamp or a no stamp. Yeah. And effectively... The machine learning part is the more the time goes by, it's the more of these come in, yep. the smarter it's going to get, the tighter it's going to get, the more it understands who's a yes and yeah. who's a no. So it increases our team's efficiency. It's great. It does a better job of it. It's a tedious task that our team doesn't necessarily want to handle. And it's like a real use case that solved buying back like hundreds of hours from our internal team a week when it came to like grading all of these applications. So like that's an example of like, AI machine learning like in real life being utilized and like there is a world of like I think that like this whole chat GPT or open AI whatever it is it's like that like there's not gonna be one AI that like helps and like solves like real world use cases it's like these little micro AIs to solve your own use cases and they're gonna be developed but also there is a world of like international engineers that are just like insane at this stuff and just build out complete like wizardry of like products, exactly what it is that you need. And if you have the idea of a task that needs to go ahead and get done, you could hire some of the best of the best team members from all around the world to understand this machine learning, understand like how to implement it into your business to build out these real like micro solutions to add a ton of efficiency in various processes throughout your organization. What would I think you, that's the win. What would you guys say to the people, the businesses that are not currently using AI in their day-to-day -day activities? Like what would you say to those people? I wouldn't say look for AI to solve a problem. I would say look into your business first, see what's annoying you and how you can find an application that will make your yeah. life easier. I, I, I wouldn't recommend anybody to use AI for the sake of using it. Yeah. I would have them use it for the sake of actually making something better. You know what I mean? Like I only buy softwares and applications and I really think of AI as like another app or another software sure. that's going to make my life easier. And as time goes by, they'll get better and better. There'll be more and more use cases. And I wouldn't care using one or 100 of them as long as it makes my life easier. Yeah. I don't want it to change my world. I just want to make things just like you said, more efficient. I agree with that statement. I think that brings me to one of the next topics I want to talk about. And it has a lot to do with like, automations in business, whether it's like AI, whether it's like utilizing workflows, utilizing Zapier, which is something that you talked about. People, like most businesses don't automate anything. Like I I have some friends that run some really successful businesses, whether they're like in the agency side of things or the e-commerce side of things. And it's like, they run massive sales organizations and like they just don't utilize or leverage any sort of automation in the day to day. And it's like a bunch of like, you know, like Neanderthal, like just, <laughs> <laughs> going like balls the walls, like salespeople that are just doing what they can, but it's like, they just no process to help like automate and like make their life easier. I think we got really lucky early because we started using active campaign yes. to build out a bunch of stuff. 
Then we got really lucky and moved over to HubSpot to build out a ton of stuff. But we didn't do it because we wanted to essentially be more efficient. We did it because there were three of us trying to run a business that operated like they were 10 of us. Yeah. And I think it's like a learning that everyone can do. And shout out to Active Campaign because Active Campaign is like low key for a simple business, like better than HubSpot. Like it, like on the automation side of things, you can do so much, so much. shit with with Active Campaign. Like sixty bucks a month. We had Active Campaign and we had Zapier and it lit Zapier, Zapier, whatever. It turned our world around. We were okay to give you guys some context. <laughs> we we had this little business. We still have it to this day. It does like one and a half million dollars a year, but it essentially sells salon apparel to salons. It was two people essentially being salesmen acting like they were 10 of us. And we're like, how do we do this at scale? We didn't want to feel like it was just us in like a little den in a basement doing this. So we created fake aliases for salespeople. And we're like, okay, we need to send out text messages for every single person individually. Then we needed to manage those. Then we sent out emails from all these aliases, Dude. including ourselves, along with having all of the conversations with all of these fake people as them. But it was like, there's two of us. Like, how the hell are we going to go about that? And to give you a that? better idea, like, what this actually looked like is someone would be like, hey, I want a salon apparel. And then we'd be like, all right, dude, here's, like, your quote. And they wouldn't respond to us. Two days later, they would get, like, without a human touching it, they would get an automatic text. <laughs> like, we were crazy. Like, an automatic email, text message, and voicemail all at the same time. Like, Active Campaign allowed us to do that. You snap your fingers, and they would just get bombarded by all three forms of communication. But guess what? Like, our efficiency moving people through this pipeline, one that taught us everything about automation, because we did it at, like, a super, like, insane level of like automating everything because like you said there was three of us and like we were working like a hundred deals at any given time we didn't have any to your point we didn't have good software either like this is before attentive and postscript and all these different we rigged everything dude, together it was such a, this is like when twilio didn't have like an right. actual proper application it was like you get a webhook and you do this and you do that and you have to get a rig everything together we were killing it it was the best but anywho, all of that to say is that like we got really good at putting things together to make it seem like you have a lot of natural human touch points. You're talking to real humans at any given time. And we were very particular, even with like the time cadences, only message people between Monday through Friday during their yeah. 10 a.m. Yep. for whatever time zone that they were in. Like we got really deep into it. So when we were talking to somebody, they would never know. But that's just like the cusp that's just like a little baby bit of what we have going on you guys and myself included literally run the heartbeat of our business through hubspot workflows through zapier and everything in between we've just gotten i would like to think a little bit smarter we're like now we could put apis together and do this and do that but you know, like maybe people don't need an automatic voicemail every two days with a text message and email all at the same time and like we kind of like yeah. toned it back a little bit but it's like dude that's the stuff that really like allowed three people to make 20 people's worth of impact i, I, and think, I think every business that's at this point where it's like you're a one-man show like dude you could implement some automation like this to like dupe you're literally just duplicating yourself 20 25 times over and it's not technical I don't know how to code. You don't know how to code. You don't know how to code. None of us know how to code. It's like, this is like one plus one equals two stuff. And I think that until people like kind of watch a single YouTube video and learn how automations or workflows or Zapier, or any of these tools work, you can rig it all together to make like amazing, huge things Quite happen. Quite easily. I think you need to be able to learn automation and understand the capabilities of automation to get out of the infancy stages of your business. 100%. I think if you're in a position where you're trying to do everything yourself, you're trying to get a rig and put everything together, you're not gonna put yourself in the best position to properly scale your business and do certain things that you're automating, you know, a follow-up process, right? You want that you want some of that stuff to be done for you rather than having to manually go in and follow up with certain people. That's just one use case, one example. But you want to be able to take a look at your business, understand what are some of the most boring parts of your business or the most tedious parts of your business that like realistically you should not have to do. If you could set up automation to take care of some of those mundane tasks, how much time would that save you? Would you be able to use that time to focus on more money-making activities for your business? 
I think that's one thing that a lot of people need to be paying a lot more attention to. Really evaluate how you're actually leveraging technology within your business and ultimately coming up with a number of things that you feel like are very tedious and finding ways that you can create automation around it. Where do you think the best play is for automation? It doesn't matter what size company you are. If there was one thing that you would automate first, what do you think it would be? It's a good question. If it comes I think to- every business is like completely different from one another. There's one pulse for everybody that you had to lay it out on. I one think, thing. I think for me, like in our business or in an e-commerce business specifically, you need a place where you can you know, manage your customers. So using a CRM or, you know, using something like a Clavio and being able to make sure that you have your campaigns build out and you have the flows, you know, set up properly and, you know, they complete certain actions for you. I think just in general, being able to use CRM technology, using, you know, different apps that will help you automate, you know, follow-up processes, I think it's just like the bare bones process. And I've, you know, if you talk to like, say, you know, people that are in the mortgage space, right? Some of those people that might be in that space, they're not really, they don't even have a follow up process. That's what it is. That's the word. It's the Neanderthals. It's follow ups. Where does that apply to the most? Sales. We just talked about this a second ago, what we were doing for sales. Yep. I don't think people inherently have an acquisition problem. I think if your product is decent and you could do a good job selling it, you'll always bring customers in the door. Now, if you could deliver that immaterial, how much yep. you pay for customer acquisition immaterial. I'm not talking about that. But from a sense of scale, mm. it's the follow-ups. It's, oh, I have to email 30 people. It's I have to make X amount of phone calls, X amount of text messages. I don't think people understand how easily, like literally within a day, it doesn't have to be perfect. Within a day, you could set up triggers for follow-up emails, sending out text messages. If you even really want to get fancy, you could send out automated voicemails to people. I see so many companies, let's take ShipBob, for example, because I just got on a call with them a couple weeks ago. They have like 70, 80 SDRs that are constantly booking appointments, doing follow-ups, getting on calls. Imagine if they had a really good automated system, how many do you think that they could get rid of? If they have like five or 10 people, do you think they would be just as efficient with the same 70 or 80? I think there's a little bit of nuance to that. I think that when it comes to automation versus human, like if you're at the point of 80 people, it's like they're they're doing that for not, an efi- they're not trying to be efficient. And I think that's a big thing. Are you trying, is your goal to be as efficient as humanly possible? If you're a one person e-commerce brand, yes, your goal is to be as efficient as humanly possible. If you're a business venture back or as big as ShipBob is and you have you know 75 SDRs, you are not trying to be efficient. You are trying to go and own as much of the marketplace as humanly possible. And when owning as much of the marketplace as humanly possible, sometimes manual reaching out, manual conversations, manual messaging for that follow up is better than the automated text message you were gonna send or the automated email that was gonna go out there. So I think it's the play. Now, if you knew exactly what was gonna go into that manual message, it's going to be the same for everybody, more or less, right? The more or less being the key factor that's over there. Because you can automate, hey, gr- hey sorry, it was great following up with you. Uh, great having a conversation with you yesterday. I want to follow up to see if you had a chance to review the agreement I sent over to you. Cool. That's more or less what the conversation is going to be. But what is the outside of that? Hey, Sarah, it was great chatting with you yesterday. Like, I know you're going to your wedding this coming Friday over here. So I hope you have a wonderful time. I just want to reach out prior to you heading out. And it's like that little piece is like a little bit of the magic that could make you a little bit more efficient when you are playing this much larger business game of not efficiency, but trying to maximize market share, which is not the place where like 99% of our listeners or the audience will be at. They are a game of like, we're a team of five people, one person, whatever it happens to be. And I need to be able to duplicate myself 25 times over. And that is where I completely agree with you, where you are right, where efficiency is everything. Beautiful. Switching topics from efficiency and zaps, but we'll still keep it on AI. Okay. And I did kind of shit post crypto and web three and all that stuff a second ago. You see Apple Vision came out. You see NVIDIA blowing up Mm -hmm. in their stock. They're crushing. One of them has a headset that just came out of $3,500. One of them is like really the backbone of AI with hardware, this and that. They're not correlated. Where this gets interesting is that Meta literally changed the name of their company from Facebook to Meta. They 
spent billions of dollars on this idea. They bought Oculus for billions of dollars. If anybody's balls deep in trying to make this headset thing work, it's, it's them. Yeah. Yeah. They have a $500 headset. One of them's a $3,500 headset. Nobody's using this one, and it's at $500 with billions of dollars back into sure it. for sure buy the Apple one. And the other one is over here that's $3,500. Nobody knows what the fuck it's going to do. We saw a keynote. Apple always kicks ass at doing it. But, like, who's going to use this one? Who's going to use this one? Why even use them in the first place? And if VR has been around for so long, the most important question is, what's going to make somebody a believer? Well, the question is, like, why do we all have the, like, preliminary thought like i've never wore a vr goggle but like why do i think it sucks existingly right now like why do i think inevitably that the oculus is just not functional why do you think it sucks i, it's not I don't know i just i think seen for utilizing and raving about it or having like it's not it's not like in my world you know what i mean like i haven't seen anyone like making noise with it or like you know walking down the street with it it's or not like aesthetically that. pleasing first and foremost i think when but is the goal to be aesthetically pleased sorry to cut you up it's like you're not wearing this around in Starbucks. Your goal is not to look sexy. You're going to be in your living room. Adoption, right? We're talking about the ability to have this type of VR product be mass adoption. And I think, you know, the aesthetic, certainly I'm paying attention to that as one thing. Number two, like if you're actually wearing it, you don't know what's really happening around you. With this new Apple Vision product, That that's the first product that you actually can see what's happening around you there's there's additional kind of features that makes it unique compared to you know oculus or you know some of the other vr products that happened before and realistically i think the technology itself within the apple vision product is so new to age and so unique that nothing like this has ever existed that people are going to be bound to have you know there's this product is bound to have a strong early adopter you know what i think you think it's out of curiosity because you said when this thing comes out, yeah, I'm 100% on board. Why? I'll tell you why right now. We all have Apple laptops. What kind of phone do you have? iPhone. What kind of phone do you have? iPhone. When was the last time you had anything that wasn't an Apple laptop and an Apple iPhone? Blackberry. Back right. in the day. Long Seventh grade. Ago. We've but all just chosen to adopt everything that Apple puts out there. We're a bunch of Apple fangirls. Like, realistically, there's a perceived value of how this product is going to be just – is like, like Apple wouldn't launch shit is really the way I look at this. Like, dude, my AirPods, like I thought they were going to be ass. They're great. You know what I mean? It's like, I think when you get that, it's brand at the end of the day, like Apple's brand is so strong that they can take something that's just as gutter as an Oculus that no one has adopted. No one is utilizing the real world. And the fact that they are launching something, this is like, to me, I look at this like the original iPod touch, which is like, dude, they're like they just changed the game and here's our opportunity to own this like relic product that's going to probably suck and not be like all there at the same time. But it's like they're going to get there. And the fact that it's Apple, they're the ones that are going to do it. But do we know if, for example, the Oculus and what Facebook's going on sucks or is this a classic? We are iPhone fanboys. We are Apple and heads Android. versus like. These are Android guys. There's a whole universe of them out there. We just, <laughs> the neck beard. I think don't it also, know any of them. It also comes down to how you're going to be able to use the technology it itself. It I think matter. it does because when you're talking about Facebook, that they're creating almost like a metaverse, right? That's what their goal and everything they're trying to do is creating like a virtual universe. I think of is Sims. Apple, is Apple going to do that? Could they do that? I, I mean, I think they certainly can. I don't know. But that's, that's also something to kind of think about is the use case of the technology. Yeah, we love Apple. I don't wear an Apple you know, um, watch, but I love all other Apple products outside of the watch. It just doesn't, it doesn't work for me. But for this product, I think because it is such a revolutionary update to VR that's unlike anything before – there is going to be a lot of people that start to, you know, use this technology within, you know, people's means. Like, you know, not everyone is going to be able to afford this product, but I think people are going to start using it, and that product will be innovated significantly if yeah. there is enough early adopters to the product. I look at it like a TV. Do you guys remember the big chunky TVs? Like our parents had them in our living room, which was like it was like a cabinet. It was like a whole huge thing. You're like five thousand dollars. Now you can get a 75 inch 4K TV for I don't know thousand bucks. I think that economies of scale will come in. But fascinating thought here: you buy the Oculus full price, or not the Oculus, the Apple Vision for thirty five hundred dollars over here, 
but somebody gives you an Oculus for two hundred dollars, which one do you take? I won't use the Oculus. I'll I mean, I'll never, try to use. I'll once. just never adopt it. But you've never tried either. If someone gives I'm gonna you that opportunity, I'm going to try harder to get the thirty-five hundred dollar. It's just perception of value. It's like you've invested into it, and it's like you were just going to like you put thirty-five hundred bucks in. You were going to try to make this thing work out. I don't see a world of this being like a revolutionary real world application use case this is part of my every day where it is right now but i do think it's like that's not what early adoption is about early adoption is about like like just f like purchasing and figuring it out and like finding the first couple of use cases and i think that like it goes back to like this is apple and this is android why do you think it's gonna win I think who's gonna win? I no. think the people that are gonna win is whoever can take this technology and actually make it into a contact, like as what a contact mean? lens. So like you can take this technology that exists within the VR and being able to virtually kind of touch what's around you, but have that within your contact. So now it's actually not a physical product that's around you. You have it in yeah. your contact. And Didn't it becomes Google an try to do that with their glasses? But that's some like that's some like real big business shit. Like I think what more is more important than that is like think of like think of the iPhone. Who wins in the iPhone? Cool. The I Apple obviously won with the iPhone, but like so did all of these apps that got created. Some being the games, some being the Tinders of the world, some being the Facebooks of the world. Sure. This is a new piece of hardware that is going to open up a new app store. And I think that those are going to be the everyday winners. Sure. I think eventually 20 years from now, 10 years, we're moving fast with technology. The contact stuff will be a better use case. But I do think that when, if this does adopt like real world application utilization, the way that any of us in this room could be able to get involved and have a massive W is by, you know, creating the first like, you know, chess app for your, like, through it. You know what I mean? It's just those, like, little... I'd never work another day in my life. You know what Ever. I mean? It's, like, those little, like, random use case. Like, who is the first to blitz to create the most random little games Fun on first. it? Fun first. But it's, like, it's the stuff that everyone's doing. Like, who, like, chess is, like, probably one of the most popular games in the entire world. Probably is the most popular one. So it's, like, who makes the first generic... Chess is not patented, from what I understand. It's, like, who makes the first original chess app or, like, checkers or any of those, like, ran insert random use case for that use case. And that's how the average Joe can make it big in this. Assuming that it has the adoption that we've seen in some of the other Apple products. Dude, did we all think, at least I'll speak for myself, like I thought the iPad was going to like be the most useless. I think, I still think it's the most useless thing, but I still see people running around with iPads. Everywhere, dude. Every I restaurant hired... you go to. <laughs> And you have a daughter now. Imagine her in she's three years. It's going to get an iPad dude, and it's just going to rock her world. She's not getting one. But like, we'll see. Dude, she, iPads we'll are just see. L's. Like I had, we had a guy start his first day of work with an iPad instead of a laptop. Shout out to this guy. Not even going to mention his name over here. But if you think you're going to get work done on an iPad, you are absolutely confused. But I think this is one of those revolutions like the iPad over here. Where it's like, all right, there's like minimal use case. But people will just use it because it's cool. Whoever makes a way to make this fun and can get other people to adopt who is going to win. I 100% agree with you. I think Apple will figure it out. I'll give you a great use case. I love fishing. Can't fish anywhere around here. Red algae essentially just sucks oxygen out of the water. All the fish die. I would kill to fish. If I could put this thing on. Is that going to be the same experience, though? It's going to be good enough, hopefully. That's Dude. the point. I don't make think that's it good that's like enough. Nintendo Wii, man. You're talking about Nintendo Wii yeah, right now. Yeah, I don't, like, I don't, I think I don't buy that. It's it's AR. It's augmented reality. It's the idea of like you utilizing chess, and the chess board is now here. It's the idea of you watching a movie on a plane, and you're in a theater. It's like that's like the initial use case. That Would I've you go seen. catching Pokemon with this thing? That, that's see, that's what I'm saying. Like, Fuck no. But then why would you fish? Like that's so whack. Because I can't fish. I get it. That's but, the point. Because like, I can't is, go fish. Do you enjoy the act of like. Like, to me, the act of fishing is all in the environment that you're in. You know what I mean? Like, That's, to your point, this is the point. Imagine you live somewhere where there's no beach. Okay? Just imagine. You're in Idaho or whatever. Well, Idaho has lakes, but whatever. You're in the middle of Saudi Arabia, right? You're not going fishing. You're not going by the water. That's the type of experience that I would, as an end user, really appreciate. Chess, to your point. I can buy a chessboard for $20. I have a million of them, right? And I could play whenever I want, or I could go on my computer and I could play. I want to do something that I wouldn't normally be able to do. I think what would be really cool, and I think a, a use case that wouldn't be that hard to actually put into fruition maybe in the next couple of years is like, 
through sports. Like imagine being sitting right at the 50 yard line, right that there, sports side watching, you know, LeBron James, you know, being able to be at a sporting event through Dude, VR, I think is huge. Imagine a company like ESPN or even like, let's bring it even more granular, Staples Center, Crypto Arena, whatever. They have tickets that they'll sell you through VR that are courtside, but instead of paying ten, fifteen thousand dollars to watch the game, you pay five hundred dollars and they'll allot, for example, make it exclusive. Only a hundred people can purchase that singular ticket to have that same lens. You don't have to worry about the drive. You don't have to worry about parking. Maybe you live in a different state and you can't watch the Lakers because you're again in Idaho, whatever. But you could buy this thing, you could put it on. It will change the way that sporting events take place. Now, granted, there will be nothing better than being at the game, even if you're a nosebleed. I truly believe that because there's an energy yeah. difference. But imagine watching it through that lens, how much money you can make as ESPN or whoever owns that facility. Or the events, like let's say it's Beyonce, she's on stage. It's like this seat is right there in the front. Like th there's a million use cases for yeah. it. You could attend Coachella virtually. And I think that there is like a, it's kind of like the digital webinar in-person event type of thing. And guess what? Digital webinar still send, sells a fuckload of you They know, still tickets. crush. You know what I mean? That would be really fun. It'll be interesting to see how this thing rolls out. But yeah, Apple Vision, I think that they're going to win. Do you buy or no buy? I don't buy yet. I'll have you buy and I'll use it we'll, when I'm we'll at your house. We'll buy together. We'll, we'll explore <laughs> together. We'll all test it out. I'm sure it's going to do some cool things. I buy some pretty off-the-cuff stuff and try to pitch people to like use it with me. I'm, I always do that. This is one where I'm going to take the back seat. I'm going to let you guys play around with it. and I, I'll sit there and I'll be willing to be sold. I just want somebody else to try it first. I don't want to be the pioneer on this. I'll, I'll be the bucko. Done. I'll be. <laughs> cool. I think this is some pretty cool stuff that we're talking about here. Like, I want to kind of shift topics. This is something that you had in the notes about just being able to actually do cool shit with your life and just understanding, like, you know, how much is too much from a business perspective? Like, what does that number look like? And, like, how do you balance, you know, money work wise? life with, yeah, like, you know, how much money is too much? And, like, how do you balance, like, being able to set your business goals, but also being able to balance your work life with doing things that you truly enjoy doing? Yeah, I'll give you my take on that one real quick. And, like, it's kind of interesting. So, I think it's important to figure out what this number is, I think, and, like, to figure out what it is that you want. Because I was reading a book, and the guy was – I forgot the name of the book. But the guy was talking about how, like, eventually – business is like a game right it's like it's like a rubik's cube it's like a game that you love to play would you guys agree i think so like at sure. some at a certain That's point like when you it. have when you have money it's like you it's it's a game and you really enjoy playing the game do you agree Simon? it's a competition thing cool it's a competition for sure yeah i agree game. And that's excellent. And let's say, like, I just had a kid, six months old, she's turning six months in a week, right? and not a week, in three days, like, coming in hot right now. And the question that needs to come in is if, if I was to go in the rabbit hole, just working my ass off all the time and not paying attention to her, it's like, I am choosing to play a game. I'm choosing to play with the Rubik's Cube because I think the game is fun to play rather than prioritizing the things that are actually important. So it's like, if you do see it as a game and you see it as a competition, whatever it is, it's like, what is more important than the competition? What is more important than the game it is that you're playing and identifying that and making sure you're not playing the game the incorrect way of life? It's tough for me because I think that this is very, very multifaceted. What I can tell you is this. I like chasing numbers on a board. I don't know why. That just gives me satisfaction. It's not necessarily the amount of money that's made, it's beating the number before the one. That's how I game a fight, similar to your Rubik's Cube analogy. Like, let's say we did 100 grand, but then the month after that, I did 99. My life is going to be the same. Everything's all good. Everybody's going to get paid. Everybody's going to be happy. I'm personally going to be fucking miserable. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, I think you have to ask yourself at what point is enough enough? Yeah. And what do you care more about in this world than what you're building? fundamentally i think people like starting businesses either one that they have to but two it's more to sculpture a life that they want to live but what ends up happening is the opposite you end up becoming a slave to the work you never stop working you don't take vacations and you want to get to this point where you feel like it's enough and you're but just playing this rubik's cube so hard. and it never ends and i'll tell you why 
because you go from zero to let's say 10 grand. Then you go from 10 grand to 50. By the time you're at 50 grand, your life looks a little bit different for the most part. Sure. You have a nicer car. You probably have a nicer apartment. You went from buying plain t-shirts from Kirkland and Costco to maybe you're buying it from some designer. All this to say your costs go up. You then end up putting yourself in a rat race again because all of a sudden 50 grand isn't enough. Then you get to 100, so on and so forth. But it's like bigger money, bigger problems. But it's not problems that innately come with business. You're manufacturing it yourself. So where do you step back and you truly say enough is enough? I've, to your point, automated my business enough to where I don't have to work in it. I can work on it. I just had a beautiful daughter. I could take a step back. I'm about to get married. I want to go on a vacation. And I don't have to be like five days. That's it. I got to get back to the office. Yeah. I could go for however the fuck long I want to because I created a however fuck I long I want to lifestyle. Where's the fine line? And we're all sitting here and none of us know. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, like I don't overanalyze that question. I enjoy working. I enjoy being able to solve complex problems. It, it kind of keeps me stimulated. I want to be able to help people. I want to be able to educate others. I want to be a good person as, you know, a leader of a company. And I think for me, I want to be able to do those things really well. But at the same time, I want to be able to enjoy life. I think you, you definitely want to be able to go and travel, go to the nice restaurants, being able to do things that, you know, feel right to you. And everyone has that different feeling. Some people say like, I just love to work all day long. That's not me. I don't want to be able to work all day long. But I, for me, I don't think there is a limit to what I want to be able to achieve. For me, I think I want to be able to enjoy the fruits of my labor, but I do see myself as wanting to solve big problems in the world because I truly feel within myself that I have a lot to offer and I'm doing it not for just myself. I'm doing it to hopefully leave a good footprint and, you know, have a legacy that my, at least my immediate family can be proud of. But are, say, we, are you, you willing made something to, happen? Are you willing to sacrifice everything to get there? Or is it like assuming that like, hey, these things will, oh, these four things will always come before the sacrifice? Because that's a big factor in too. I think if everyone's like, hey, dude, like how have I too much? Oh, nothing. I'm just like, I'm going to, as long as I hit my goals, I'm good to go, but I'm not willing to sacrifice anything. Cool. I think that's probably the right answer or like or in the direction of an answer. Yeah. But it's like to go and make that massive thing. Are you willing to sacrifice not being home as much and doing those things and not traveling as much or whatever it happens to be? Like, what is the, because what, what the real question is, is like, how much are you willing to lose? Like how much are you willing to actually risk or sacrifice? What's your answer? To me, it's 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 kind of difficult, right? Because the more the bigger something gets, the more that people are relying on you, Correct. and the and the more pe people rely on you, that it makes it bogs me out. And the more that people rely on you, the more difficult it becomes to be paying attention to your own needs, even if you are putting those things before everything else, right? Because you, you have an obligation to others. Yeah. When you're trying not to have an obligation to But I anything. think that's what we signed up for. No, we for sure did. I agree with that sentiment. And you have a noble pursuit that you're going after. But let's say we all sell our businesses tomorrow. And let's say we all just sit there and we say, okay, all of our needs are met. Let's say we all made $100 million. Okay, we're good. What do we do next? This is where the answer becomes interesting. I, I feel like <laughs> if, if that ever happened, like what I would want to do is take a little bit of time off. I want to actually enjoy travel, do things I've never done before. I want to be able to do some more things that I've never done before. And then once I've had a chance, you know, I'm sure after, you know, three months, four months, I'm like, all right, I, I got to get back into it. I'm going to have that itch again because that's still a part of my, you know, that that's what gets me going is actually being able to pursue something that I haven't been able to achieve. And I think you always look at, you know, business as saying, hey, I'm looking to take the next step within my business. But once you've reached a step, you almost want to create the next step for yourself. And you always want to kind of climb and get to that next level. Play the harder Rubik's Cube. I agree with your sentiment. Going to play devil's advocate. Sure. You could already do that right now. Why don't you? Because at the same time of me wanting to do great things, which I continue to do, like I'm, I'm getting married in a little over a week and a half. I'm excited for it. I'm going to go and, you know, travel for two and a half weeks. But 
at the same time, I'm, I can't go in and travel for three months. I would love to do that. Why can't you? Because I have people that rely on me. But are your money need, are your money needs met? Are my money needs met? Yes, right now they are. But that doesn't. That's not the only thing that I'm solving for. But let's keep layering on to this. Sure. You guys, we just talked about automation. I know personally that you guys have done a great job with it. I know personally this is a crazy example. If you got shot in the head today and you couldn't show up tomorrow or any other time in the universe after that, the business would run well. I'm not saying it's because you're not needed. I'm saying because you did an excellent job of building yeah. around it. Sure. So with that in mind, money needs are met, okay? The business can run, even if you take that three-month trip, why don't you take it? It's leadership. I think really it's setting what it comes an example for others yeah. as it's, well. It's, it's leadership and setting examples because it goes back to a lot of people are counting on us. You know what I mean? On our end of things. So you hire CEO and you hire CEO. But I'm not solving for a money goal. I'm solving for being able to, at least within a business perspective, I want to be able to help more businesses. I haven't done that yet. And I think by being able to still steer the wheel, we'll not only be able to help you know businesses as the way that we are now, we'll be able to ultimately help businesses in different ways. We'll get more creative with our business. We'll do things that are more unique. We'll offer better service in certain ways. I think being able to put yourself in a position where you can do the things that you want to do. You want to be able to travel. You want to be able to, for me, you know, go to restaurants, do those things and have immersive experiences. I'm going to do that no matter what, right? I'm not going to sacrifice not being able to do that for my business goals. That is very clear for me. But for me, I still want to be able to take those next steps and, you know, reach those goals from a business perspective as well. And I think based on what we've done up to this point, we can do the balance of both. You know what I'm hearing from the both of you? Sure. It's what? never enough. For me, it's not. It's It'll never be I, enough. That's well, what I'm hearing. No, I disagree with that. For statement. me, it's not. I disagree with that statement. I mean, I don't think it's like a financial enough. I think it's like the game and I think it's pal it's balancing the game. So like, let's say I didn't have the op the amount of obligation on like a business level I have as far as like, the big thing for me is like people counting. On. Like there's a lot of like leadership and counting on that, that needs to be done. But let's say that wasn't the case. I think I'd be able to like, I'd be someone that could have a million things to enjoy outside of work. And I would still want to be able to play with this Rubik's Cube. But the amount of time I spend playing this Rubik's Cube on a day-to-day -day basis won't be 10 hours a day. Would you rather spend more time enjoying life or would you rather spend more time working? Enjoying life. Then why don't you? Because I told you, I, I mean, I'm allocating right now currently a lot of time to still enjoying life. Like I'm still doing so many things that I love doing on a daily basis every single day, whether it's like, you know, working out in the morning, having a really good time, doing some hard shit right then and there, spending time with my baby in the morning before coming into work for two hours, spending time with her after work, still doing on the weekends, obviously opening that up to like activity, friends, family, all of the above there, still doing it. But right now I have existing obligations and duties that I need to be able to prioritize as well, which is leading the people that are on board this mission with us right now. Yeah. And did I you think build your work around your life or did you build your life around your work i think my work got me to the point of freedom that i'm at right now and it is a necessity to get to the point right now where i'm at in order to be able to have everything that i want i think that's what it really comes down to if that answers your question which one designs the other currently presently and, yeah i mean presently i think my life designed by work like i can i can pick and choose some of the things that I want to do, what I do, what I can, I can fully pick if I want to do something or not want to do something at this point. A couple of years ago, I would say the work first. I agree for with sure. that. A couple of years ago, absolutely, the work needed to be the priority. We didn't have a fucking choice. Yeah, we and didn't it, have and, a choice. Yeah. But listen, that's like when you get to that point, you have a responsibility to your people, your family, to hopefully you know their family one day. I want to be able to make sure I take care of the next two generations of my yeah. bloodline. I think the blueprint is this simple. You need to work your ass off to learn at first. And we jumped into entrepreneurship earlier and we learned a lot on our own and we're like struggling really hard at the same time. That's very early on. A lot of people but can you need choose. That. There's, there's one way to need that. Or, I mean, I'm seeing people around us that are working really hard, getting paid a good amount of money, and are learning a ton. So they're learning and getting that education while working with us. And I think that's obvious, like, honestly, like you gotta put someone in a better position. From there, they're getting all of these learnings and they should be able to come into a job and learn and like come in with like their brain, their 
thinking cap on, as they would say in elementary school, and learn. Learn how things are working, learn why things are working, and then figure out how they can do that themselves. From there, you now have knowledge. You then apply that knowledge into then creating the wealth necessary to be able to get and do whatever it is that you want. From there, now you have the resources to get what you want, do what you want. And from there, you could now have the same level of freedom where it's like, if I don't want to, if I don't want to work, I don't have to. Because I, I do have that level of freedom a million percent as of right now. Um, and I think that's kind of the aspiration there. Like you need to solve like your money needs. And I think that that's a super important thing to be able to have your freedom. And then from there, life becomes much easier. Money first, freedom second. But at the end of the day, I think if you choose this life, you're just going to be a sicko that's going to want to do this over and over and over again. You have the luxury and the ability to have freedom. Sure. But I don't think you ever choose that as your primary. I, well, I, these, I do. These, these Bali guys that are like, I'm a laptop nomad, whatever the fuck they want to call themselves. They could circle jerk each other off as much as they want. I think they're full of shit. I think they're making three grand a month. I don't think they're doing anything good with their life. I think it's the people that know that they can be free but choose to do this instead, those are the real winners. And, and I think the real winners are the people that will continue to want to win forever. I think the freedom to be able to allocate as much time as you want or as little time as you want to winning is the ultimate level of freedom. You can win at whatever the next endeavor happens to be or your existing endeavor by putting in two hours, three hours, four hours, but no amount of time. And you'll still get the same satisfaction of winning. I think the one thing that we still need to ask ourselves is what is your definition of freedom? Because my definition and your definition and your definition are not the same. You're, you're, the guys that you love in Bali, they have different definitions of freedom as well. That's a good point. I think I being able to understand what your end goals are, right? You know, what are things that you want to be able to accomplish in your life? What do you, when you're 75, 80, 90 years old, what do you want to be able to look back on and say you've been able to accomplish, been able to travel, be able to experience these things, being able to take care of certain people, right? You have to be able to kind of think about that and understand why you started this in the first place. So when you're talking about yourself, you know, 40, 50 years from now, you want to be able to make sure that at this moment you are doing the things that you enjoy doing and want to be doing, but ultimately you're setting yourself up for the future which I think is important as well. You want to be able to look out for your future, but also making sure that you're living in the moment. And I think being able to do the combination of both is, and knowing that I'm doing it well, that's my freedom, is knowing that I'm able to actually make sure I'm putting myself in a position for success, being able to be in the position where I'm continuing to level up, but I'm still being able to do the things I enjoy doing. Am I being able to do the things I enjoy doing at the most optimal level? No. But that's okay because I know, be. I know I'm still getting better and I'm st I know I'm getting one day closer to that end goal. Here's my final point that I want to be able to make. And this comes from that same book that I can't remember the name of. But there comes a time where you are going to be able, unable to do that thing that you want to be able to do. For example, let's say that you love skiing like myself and you want to go heli skiing. You cannot push something so far because of like your work life or whatever it is to the point that I'll do it then because eventually you will be unable to physically be able to conduct that action whether it's heli skiing whether it's like you know strike a burning man time. or whatever it happens to be so it's like and or like let's say it's even like traveling to a specific destination when you're single like luckily I had a great chance to do that went to Bali went to Thailand did a bunch of these things like that was awesome couldn't do that ever again in my entire life. Glad I got that done. But there are some things and if there are some goals that you have that are like things like heli skiing or whatever it happens to be, it's like you have a, not a finite amount of time, but there is a time window and that window does eventually close. And you need to make sure that you are not pushing some of these goals too far out where they will actually become 100% unachievable to be able to be hit. I like that. That's a good sentiment. I don't have an answer for you guys. What wasn't a question. No, his thoughts on this topic. No, yeah, thoughts on this yeah. topic. I bing bong with it back and forth all the time. What's nice is like parents are taken care of. My girlfriend can get the shit that she wants, the nice bag, she can get it, the jewelry, she can get it. Like, it's all good. I get to buy bougie waters and meat and the little weird things that I like. And can you go on a couple trips a year? 
I can go on as many trips as I want to. Do you seek to do that? No. So you're, that's that's one thing that you don't want to do. <laughs> but what are what are some other things that you do enjoy doing, and are you doing those things? I think that's a question that you, you should kind of be clear on. I have hyper – like I hyper obsess over hobbies, and I have a ton of them. Like I love playing chess. You guys know of another one that I love that I may not talk about now, but it involves <laughs> – going out into the wilderness a lot and shooting some lead, whatever that may mean. Like I really enjoy hobbies and I get to do all of them all the time that I'm really happy with. But I think whether I had $1, whether I had $10 billion, like I would be able to figure out how to do it. I just want to win more. I really like winning. I really like getting in the office every day and I create a fake competition in my head and it's like me against the world. That's why I like chess. It's one to one. There's no odds other than you winning or losing. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrestled. That's why I love MMA. There's no other outside variables. Like for me, I really love that mono y mono thing. And I really, truly wake up every day and I'm like, it's me against the world. And I get to help people along the way with the businesses. I'm happy with that. But I don't think about it in that sense very often. Do you, fulfill, do you feel fulfilled? No, not at all. Why? Not even close. Because you're just not there yet? You know what it is? It's like, you know who you are and you know where you want to go. And I don't really think about who I am as a person right now. I always think about who I can be in the 2.0 version of myself that I look up to. And like, this was a thing from Matthew McConaughey in like an Oscar speech, like many, many moons ago, but it really stuck with me. I always care about who I'm going to be later. I'm happy with who I am now. Don't get me wrong. But like this to me, isn't who I am. I'm etching for something over here. I'll never reach it because once I hit that guy, whoever I think that guy is, I'll create another fantasy of the other guy. The next guy. Yeah. So like that, my fulfillment, I guess, is baked in the journey. It's not so much the person that I'm going to be. So will I ever be fulfilled? No. Am I grateful? 100%. But will I ever truly be fulfilled? I don't know. But if I get to help people along the way, I'm cool with that. But that's not what I bank my morals on. And that's not what like makes me feel good. I think a balance of that is is important. Because I think that the balance of it well, I like personally I feel a little bit I feel pretty fulfilled. But at the same time I do think that there is a need and a desire to chase like the future of yourself. And not on a work level, but on an everything level. On yeah. a, on a yes, very hundred percent on a three dimensional level 100%. of your life. So what does that look like for you, Ashkin? I think there's a lot of elements to it. Like I think a couple different things for myself. And like a lot of this hits like when you have a kid, like just had a baby. You know what I mean? And it's like, all right, for me there's a couple Everything different Everything changed, pillars. huh? Like literally lot. overnight you It allows you to like really like understand what you care about. Like one is I right, on a business level, I want to make sure like family's good, life is good, like all of the above. Want to be able to produce the best environment for my daughter as humanly possible. Two, I want to make sure she's like the best of the best. Like not only has everything, but like I want to make sure she's positioned. You don't want a schmuck child. Dude, the, you there's three ways you can parent a kid, I think. There's one way where you can put them in a bad position, meaning like you talk shit about them, you're negative to them, whatever it happens to be. Obviously you don't want to do that. Option two, which is where I think the majority of people put them into, is like you just like kind of give them like you know, you give them the need, the the things necessary, and you, like you you make them like really average, which is like you know, dude, you you had lunch money, you went to school, like you did all these things, like you went to soccer practice, like whatever. Their basic needs are met. Basic That's needs, level two. It, it's not excellence. And then the third way sure. of doing things is to try to get them to be and position them to be absolutely excellent. And like, how do you do that? And it's by like by like getting them there. Like one, inspiring them to be there, showing yourself being excellent at various different talking points or different things, doing hard shit so they can learn from it. Um, three is challenging them to be able to do something. If you see a passion of theirs, whether it's like gymnastics or soccer or whatever, Double like down. Patrick Bet David, I love what he does with his kids there. He's like, my kid, and like I've been paying attention to a lot of it. It's like, my kids, they have an iPad. They only get access to the iPad on Saturdays and Sundays if and only they if. They read a book. They, a couple different things. One, they need to be getting straight A's and B's in school, no C's, or they're not getting the iPad for the month or whatever the quarter is. Two, they need to be reading at least X amount of pages of the book, depending on age, 10, 15, or 20 pages. Three, kids love basketball. You need to make 60 shots every single day. Seven days a week if you want to be able to play with your iPad on that Saturday and Sunday. And there's various other things. And you are now positioning that kid for excellence. And I think that that is one of the big things that I want to do. Outside of that, my own personal fitness and health, like I want to be able to like, to like 
fuck up her dog like her like potential boyfriends later and like scare them i think it's like a very real <laughs> thing i want to be able to like compete and really be able to like whoop people's ass at my age or younger than my age when it comes to like anything physical is like a massive desire of mine as well like i think and then i want to be like very well versed when it comes to like being able to talk about different things based off real world experiences and i think that i'm walking that path and getting there and i want to see myself be able to continue to get there You've clearly been in much more of a monk mode than I have been, or even he has been. We're just trying to rip faces and take names, and this guy's living his best life. <laughs> yeah. I no, I mean, I think there's a lot of merit to what it. he's saying there. I Me mean, too. First, I love it. First and foremost, he would have never got that iPad. Just be very truthful. Ashton would have never got that iPad. He did not read that often. I didn't either, so I'm, I'm kind of following the same boat. But I do think those are good things to aspire for your children, to have a little bit of discipline. I also think related to your topic – you don't want to coddle. You actually want them to experience. You want them to try different things. You want to be able to make sure we can put our family and our you know, people in a position to have a good life. Yeah. And I think being able to really think about you know, what are the things that we really desire um, for ourselves, what are the things we desire for our children, and we should try to build that life for them. We should try to put ourselves in a position to you know put ourselves in a position to do those great things yeah i totally agree one note for you for your daughter whenever i would get in a fight when i was younger like my dad would let me come home and just be bloody the fuck up like i would come home with broken noses and black eyes i used to get into a ton of fights and he would never be like don't do that again he would never be like go back and do something about it he's like you got your ass kicked good like lick your wounds Figure it out, and next time you'll get better. And I just think like some things need to be experienced and just like you said, not coddled. You need to get smacked in the face to yeah. either learn, don't get smacked, or get better to not get smacked the second time. So I think there's a balance to it. This guy's all about balance. Dude, you got to like, throttle, baby. It's a beautiful daughter, man. Like I don't want to get hurt at the same time. It's different if it was a boy. I do believe in gender equality a million percent across the board, but at the same time, it's like, dude, I want to make sure she's good. So like, we'll we'll get there, I think. But I think there are some things I have control in, making sure she's smart, making sure she's a good decision, making sure I'm a great dad to her mom so she doesn't fall for some losers. Like, dude, you that's need to a good set one. them That's the key shit. right there. I think yeah, that's, that's what we were doing. That's yes. like the, the key oh that we should leave off here on this episode is like, Set the right example for your family. Be that person that you want to be. Aspire to be the best version of yourself each and every day and be an example where they can look up to. And I think if you can do those things and you're leaving, you're leading the life that you feel is in your position to you know, do great things for your family and they can see that you're doing great things for them, I think you're going to put themselves in the best position to do great things in their lives. And I think the people that may not have that kind of aspirations for themselves they may have difficulties in you know being able to bring their children up and having them go through you know the system and you know being able to have them have aspirations for themselves i think it is it can certainly be a great representation for your kids if they see you doing great things as well yeah lead by example and the people that want to sit around and wither away fuck them fuck them it's your life you design it, have fun with it. And I think that's a really good place to halas. All right. Well, Speaking of halasing, I think it's time to go at this point right now. What's the ending note? You got you gave an intro, now you gotta give an outro. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Let us know your thoughts. Leave some comments. We'd love to hear your feedback. If there's anything you want us to talk about, hit us up. That's and a pod. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys. <whistles> Boom.